fellow uh, men and women of God and Elam Theological Institute studies. God bless you. Yesai Ogwedu, Opak Ruoth, Opaki Yesu, Hallelujah. Saints, fellow saints in Christ Jesus, I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and Amor Ahinya. I am happy to be with you, um, at least by video, but I am looking forward to being with you in Siaya uh, in a few months. <laughs> um, so today we're, we're continuing on in the joy of the Old Testament, our, our study through Old Testament survey, part one, Genesis through uh, Genesis, um, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The five books of Moses, the Torah, that is the teaching or the instruction of the Lord. And I just want to build you up and encourage you uh, in my time in the Word. Earlier this morning, I was reading through uh, Psalm 16, one of my favorite psalms. And when I came to verse 3, David says about the people of God, he says this, As for the saints who are in the earth, the holy ones, the called out ones, they are the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. That Hebrew word uh, majestic can be translated excellent or noble or glorious. Friends, that is how David viewed the people of God. And he viewed the people of God that way because that's how God views us as well. We are saints, hallelujah, in Christ Jesus. That's our identity. And if David way back in the Old Testament and in the Old Covenant could express a love and a affection and a devotion to the people of God like he did, then it is vital for us to have that same heart of God for the people that we are teaching and ministering to and pastoring. They look up to us. We have influence in their lives in the way that we carry ourselves, in how we speak to them, in how we pray for them, and how we greet them. And it's so important to continually ask God to give us His heart for His people and to ask God to help us to, to know Him truly and to develop a, a greater understanding of His love for us. As a matter of fact, before we get into further into the study, I'm going to pray right now one of the great prayers that Paul prayed for the church in Ephesus, which is in modern day Turkey. That's where it's located. And it's one of my favorite prayers. I prayed it for you earlier this morning, but I'm going to pray it now again for you. I want you to hear me pray this prayer uh, for you, which is in the Word of God, inspired by the Word of God, and therefore we know that it's the will of God to answer exactly as it has been written and prayed for by the Apostle Paul. So, Father, I bring now my, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in the beautiful nation of Kenya, in Siaya. And I ask that you would grant every one of them, according to the riches of your glory, to be strengthened with power through your spirit in their inner man so that Christ may dwell in their hearts through faith and that being rooted and grounded in love they may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that they may be filled up to all the fullness of God. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. My friends, I, I want to ask you, is that a prayer that God wants to answer? Yes, it is. And if it's good enough for the Apostle Paul, it's good enough, good enough for us to pray as well.
The other, um, I was reading in Romans 8 this morning, and I thought I would share that with you as well, uh, just as a reminder of who you are in Christ. In Romans 8, verse 16, Paul says, The Spirit Himself, the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, testifies within our spirit that we are children of God. You, my friend, are a child of God. You are a son of God. You are a daughter of God who loves you and brought you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. There were no gods or goddesses in, in the New Testament times or even in the Old Testament times who cared at all about their followers. But Paul says that the Holy Spirit lives within us and he witnesses in us that we are children of God. And then he says, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider, he says in verse 18, that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that is to be revealed to us. And I just pray that those verses will encourage you uh, today and beyond and that they will really set the table, that they will set the tone for our continued study uh, today. Um, one thing I always forget to, to share with you is, uh, let's see, just over my left is a picture of uh, William Tyndale. If you are the recipient of the ESV study Bible that we were able to get many students, or the NLT study Bible, obviously those Bibles are translated into English, then we can thank that man right there. He was an Englishman that lived in the 1500s who could not stand the fact that uh, no one had Bibles, that there, you couldn't own a Bible back in those days. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church dominated uh, the nation of England, and they would only allow the priests to have Bibles, and the priests hardly ever even read the Bibles. And even if you could get a copy of the Bible, it would cost you about a year's salary. And moreover, the Bible was translated into Latin. But if you lived in English in, in England and you were not educated, uh, that is in a university setting, then you couldn't speak Latin. Latin was the language of the educated class. English was the common language. Well, William Tyndale was educated, I can't remember if it was either it was either at Oxford or Cambridge. I think it was Oxford. He was a Roman Catholic priest. He was a professor of theology. But he, he realized how ignorant the, the priests were in the Roman Catholic Church. And because they were ignorant of Scripture, he realized how ignorant of Scripture they were. And because they were ignorant, they never preached from the Bible. And consequently, the churches were malnourished. They were starving for the truth of God's Word. And so Tyndale went to the leaders of the Roman Catholic Church and, and proposed to them that he translate the Bible from the original Hebrew and the original Greek into English so that everyone in England could read the Bible for themselves and understand it. And the leadership of the Roman Catholic Church turned him down because they understood that if the people got a hold of the Word of God, they would find out that a lot of the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church were heretical. And so Tyndale said, okay, then, I mean, to himself, he left the nation of England, went over to the Netherlands, began um, fervent, earnest um, work to translate the scriptures into the English language, and he would smuggle those Bibles back into England, oftentimes in big crates of flour. Well, the Roman Catholic Church realized what he was doing, and they sent an assassin to uh, get to know Tyndale and uh, 
Tyndale was very, very careful, but on this one particular case, this man was able to deceive him, and they became friends, and the man turned him in to the authorities, and Tyndale was burnt, was was choked to death um, on a uh, like a wooden cross with uh, a fire underneath him uh, out on the open streets in I think it was Nether the Netherlands. And uh, they, they began to choke him to death and light the fire. And as the fire was, was consuming his body, he prayed this prayer, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. And I believe at the time the king was Henry VIII. Don't quote me on that. I'm, I, I can't remember right now. I need to go back and refresh my church history, which I'm going to do church history for you. But um, eventually, the King of England uh, gave permission for the Bible to be translated. And as a result, we had the first English translation of the Bible in the King James Version. And that Bible translation completely changed and transformed the nation of England. Um, and eventually, Roman Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church was overthrown. England became an Anglican uh, country. And then, of course, missionaries left England and came over to our land, the United States of America. And our nation was birthed with the scriptures. And that's why, that's the reason why we've been so free and so prosperous in so many ways. But our nation is becoming more and more corrupt because people are too arrogant and too proud and too rich to have anything to do with God and consequently God is backing off on our nation and he's saying go ahead and do what you insist on doing and our nation is in is in turmoil in so many ways because we're rejecting God and you can't reject God and not pay a price for it but that's one of my heroes uh, William Tyndale I'm taking a little bit longer than I I want to on this next time I'm going to share with you about another hero of mine his name is Booker T Washington he is um, a was a mighty man of God a great educator african-american uh, he was born into slavery he was born into slavery um, just shortly before uh, our Civil War and he became one of the finest educators in our nation's history. I'll share more about him later another time. And then the, uh, the other picture. You know, I have pictures because they inspire me. And this right here, you can see, guess what? These are Kenyan boys. They are, uh, this picture was taken, they, they live in uh, near Masai Mara. And the picture was taken by a young high school student of these boys playing soccer. And uh, I happened to see the picture at an art show at the high school, and it was much, much bigger. And I just fell in love with it. It happened right after I came back to Kenya. And um, the the wife of my one of my ministry partners, who does the technical work on my radio ministry, um, she bought that for me because she knows how much I love it. And the reason why I love it is it re just, re to me, if someone would say to me, describe Kenya, I would say, that's it right there. For me, I have more joy when I come to Kenya than, than at any other time. I just am so full of joy. That's why I often say, Amor Ahinya, I'm happy. And um, I, it just... Just the simplicity of life. For me, uh, I'm happy with simple things. My wife is happy with simple things. It doesn't take a lot to keep us happy. And material things are not that important to us. That is just that simple joy is to me what it's all about. I hope that blesses you. Um, all right, now we need to get into our study. And where I left off um, previously was on the topic of salvation history. 
Now, it's highly instructive for us that Abraham, that's what we were talking about Abraham when I left off. Uh, I think the last, I said I needed to take a break. Uh, I did, I was tired. So it's highly instructive for us that this man, Abraham, becomes the father of faith. And I'll let you look up the scriptures there. Uh, he's the father of faith of all who believe. Despite some faith failures from Abraham, the thing I love about God is God looks at Abraham's overall life and counts him a man of faith. God does not reject Abraham and his, and his good works and his belief in God and his trust in God simply because he had some failures. God looks at Abraham's overall life. And that's encouraging uh, for us. And that's one of the, the things that brings us joy from the Old Testament is seeing that in Abraham's life. Now, uh, his test of faith in believing God for a son and an heir and for God's promises to come to pass uh, in Abraham and in his son Isaac, the, this test was surely one of the most strenuous tests of faith in all the Bible. I often, when I'm, when I'm looking to stand in faith, um, I often will quote Romans 4, 17 through 22, which Paul is quoting from the Old Testament to build my own faith. And I often will remind myself that the things that I am trusting God for and having to wait on him for, Abraham waited 25 years. And so when I quote that passage, it renews my mind and it builds my faith. And of course, I know it by heart. And here is what it is. As it is written, when Paul says it is written, that, that phrase in Greek is in the perfect tense. What that means is that it was written then and its authority remains in effect. That's a very good insight. What is Paul doing? He's looking back to the Old Testament and he's saying that the Old Testament is scripture. So he says, as it is written, a father of many nations have I made you. What is the Hebrew word for nations? It is Goyim. It is the Gentiles. It's you Kenyans. It's, it's us Americans. The gospel is not just for the Jews. It begins with the Jews and then it goes out to the whole world. Uh, as it is written, a father of many nations have I made you in the sight of him whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. In hope against hope he believed, in order that he might become a father of many nations, according to that which had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. Genesis 12, Genesis 13, Genesis 15, Genesis 17, Genesis 18, and Genesis 22. According to that which had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. And without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb, who was 90. So he, he wasn't denying circumstances. Yet, with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that what he had promised, what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Therefore, also, it was reckoned to him, to Abraham, or counted to him as righteousness. Isn't that inspiring? Paul quotes all that from Genesis in the Old Testament. There's the joy of the Old Testament. I have quoted that passage. I want to be careful not to exaggerate. 
I'm just going to say thousands of times throughout my life. I mean, it's a, it's a very, very important passage for me to stand in faith on. So I just love this man of faith. And he had to wait 25 years for that promise to be fulfilled until he was as good as dead. So then God could only get the glory. Now, um, so Abraham had to wait 25 years for the promises to begin to be fulfilled. And when his son of promise, Isaac, not Ishmael, was just a boy, just a lad, probably no more than maybe 11 or 12 years old, God tested him in Genesis 22, one of the tenderest, gripping chapters in the whole Bible. Abraham, take now, let me read it, Genesis 22. Genesis 22 and verse 1. And in the Hebrew, it actually says this. It, you can just hear the tender affection of God when he says to him, Abraham, Genesis 22 verse 1. Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and, and notice the response right away, Hineni is what it is in Hebrew, translated in English, here I am, but you know what it really means? Here I am ready to do your will. That's what it means. Hineni, Hineni, can you say that with me? Hineni, here I am ready to do your will. And then God said to him, take now your son, your only son, your only son, whom you love. Oh, I just feel it right now. Isaac. Yitzhak in Hebrew. Yitzhak means laughter. Because Yitzhak brought great joy and laughter to Abraham and to Sarah. And partly, he was named Yitzhak because Sarah laughed when she heard the promise of God. And he says, go now to the land of Moriah. This is where, this is Jerusalem. This is the height of where the temple would eventually be built. And offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, of which I will tell you. Oh, can you imagine, you sons, you uh, fathers or daughters uh, or um, mothers, can you imagine what gripped him? He waited 25 years for this promise to be fulfilled. Now he has many years with Isaac and he's so happy. And now God says, sacrifice him. Just like the pagans used to do in in. Mesopotamia, in Ur of the Chaldees, where Abraham lived. How confusing it must have been, and yet he stood in faith, believing that God was just testing him, and that God himself would provide the sacrifice. Well, I'm not going to read the whole story, but as we know, Abraham carries out the promise, and just when he is ready to plunge the knife, into Isaac's neck and slit his neck open. What happens? One of the most exciting things in the entire Bible. In verse 11, the angel of Yahweh. There is a manifestation, uh, a, um, uh, well, I can't remember the word. I'll come back to it. A theophany. A theophany is a, an appearance of God in, in, in human form prefiguring uh, the coming of Jesus. And um, he says, take now, verse 11 of Genesis 22, uh, the angel of Yahweh called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And once again, Abraham says, Hineni, here I am willing to do your will. And then, of course, he says, do not stretch out your hand against the lad. 
what I forgot to mention in, in verse 1, when God says to him, I'm sorry, in Genesis 22, 2, he, when, when Moses says, uh, when he says in verse 2, he said, take now your son, your only son. In Hebrew, the word is please. God says to Abraham, please take now your son, your only son whom you love. It's very rare in scripture for God to use the word please. I want to just impart there the heart of God for his people. Even though he allows us to go through tests, there's the, there's the tone of genuine, gentle care and concern. One of the greatest chapters in the Bible, amen? It's just fantastic. And that's all part of salvation history. Now, perhaps moments before Abraham was ready to slay his son on an altar, which Abraham and Isaac made, can you imagine that? God provided a substitutionary sacrifice. And you know, my friends, it was on the same mountain that Jesus himself would be sacrificed, where God would send his only son to the cross and there would be no no escape there would be no provision for him to escape he was the sacrifice he was the lamb of god that would take away the sin of the world i was reading again in romans 8 this morning he who did not spare his own son but delivered him over for us all, how will he not with him also freely give us all things? I'm believing God for something that's very important and necessary that built my faith. But God the Father provided a sacrifice for Abraham, but he didn't provide a sacrifice for his own son. Jesus himself was the sacrificial lamb. And you know, my friends, I think that you know, when in Luke chapter 24, if you'll turn with me to Luke 24, and this is all relevant, Luke 24, Jesus is in his resurrected form, and he, um, this is the passage where he goes on the road to Emmaus with two disciples, and then he has a meal with them, and after they eat, he says to them in Luke 24, Verse 44, now he said to them, watch this, these are my words, which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, remember this is a Jewish way of speaking about the whole Old Testament, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. You know that one of the things that, one of the areas that Jesus took his disciples to in the Old Testament was Genesis 22. You know that. And you know he took them to Isaiah 53. And then showing his deity. Then, this is one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. Verse 45, then he, Jesus, opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And that's why, one of the reasons why I always say it's vital for us to pray before we open the word of God. Because if Jesus does not open the word of God for us, we're not going to get anything out of it. And it's a humble act as well to pray. Now, how rich the Old Testament is. Can I get an amen out there? Amen. Erro kamano ahinya. Asante sana. Praise the Lord. Opak ruoth. Hallelujah. Opak yesu. Opak ruoth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Be roho maler. Njo mtakatifu. Njo roho mtakatifu. Mtakatifu. Amen. I need to get to Kenya so I can practice my Luo and Swahili a little bit better. Well, all this introduces us to the important doctrine of election. 
election. God chose and called a man to himself by grace through faith. When, his, when he called Abraham, it wasn't because Abraham was righteous at the time. It wasn't because he did good works. Abraham was an idolater in the land of uh, Ur of the Chaldees in Mesopotamia. But God called him out of darkness and into his marvelous light that he may proclaim the excellencies of him. That, that is just, I'm quoting from 1 Peter uh, chapter 2. It's just a marvelous thing. The word of God is exciting, amen? So we are witnessing, Koro, we are witnessing a vital theological topic, and that is the unity of the Bible. How the, the unity of the Old Testament with the New Testament, especially in, in the area of promise and fulfillment. Let me ask you a question. Has God fulfilled his promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, that he would make him the father of many nations? Yes, he has. And he's continuing to fulfill it as well. We are products of that fulfillment. We are in Abraham. We are Abraham's offspring. The gospel has literally gone forth to the nations. The Gentiles, I've never shared this with the leaders, or I don't think I've shared it with anybody uh, among the leadership or all the Kenyan pastors uh, and Elam Theological Institutes, but many decades ago, before I ever knew that God would call me to Kenya and Uganda and Africa, before I share that, please let me remind you that you can hear me preach every Sunday night on Voice of Hope Africa, and um, I'm not quite sure what time my radio broadcast comes on. It's shortwave radio. Um, I, I won't take the time to find the station now, but look it up if you will. Voice of Hope Africa, it's, it, my broadcast airs every Sunday night. Right now I'm going through Colossians, and I hope that you'll listen to it. It's only a 30 minute broadcast. Tell your friends as well. Please help spread the word with me. Anyway, um, many decades ago, God gave me Isaiah 42, verses 6 and 7, as part of my ministry call. And it says this, I am Yahweh. I have called you in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you and I will appoint you as a covenant to the peoples as a light to the nations to open blind eyes to deliver prisoners from the dungeon and those who dwell in darkness from the prison and I never could understand why God would give me a verse like that and never give me the opportunity to fulfill it but I had to wait until I was ready many many years probably a couple decades it might have even been 25 years and now by God's grace not because I'm better than anybody else I don't even know why he would choose me but now my radio broadcast reaches all 52 nations in the awesome continent of Africa especially in the 1040 window hold on let me show you hold on one second Especially, this is one of the gifts that the, uh, the leaders gave me several trips ago. I have it hanging on my wall. It's very, very uh, precious to me. Now, the 1040 window is 10 degrees longitude and 40 degrees latitude. And who lives in most of these nations in Africa? They're all Muslim nations. So the gospel is not being gotten out in those nations. And in God's providence, he's allowed me to preach the gospel on shortwave radio. The genius of shortwave radio is that you can't stop it. If I contacted the government of Libya and said, hey, I want a Christian radio you know, on FM or AM, it's not going to happen. But now the gospel is getting into the 1040 window in the fruit of the Spirit, and the power of the Spirit, verse by verse, to deepen believers there. 
encourage pastors, strengthen churches, and to win Muslims to faith in Jesus. My friends, will you pray for me that God would expand that ministry, that God would draw people into the broadcast, that he would use the broadcast to lead thousands and thousands and thousands of Muslims to faith in him, and that he would use the broadcast to encourage pastors, raise up leaders, encourage churches, and deepen churches throughout Africa, but especially in the 1040 window. Please, please pray for me in that area and cover me from the powers of darkness. Ervo Kamano Ahinya, Asante Sana. Praise the Lord. Opak Ruov. Opaki Yesu. Yesu Oheri. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I feel like I'm not getting enough teaching done, so let me try to get some more in. My friends, the gospel has gone forth to the nations, the Gentiles. The fact that we're born again is evidence of the ongoing fulfillment and the faithfulness of God to Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. And the judgment and defeat of many nations Gentile nations that have tried to destroy Israel, plus Israel's regathering, is further evidence of the ongoing fulfillment of this incredible prophecy. Closely related to it is the con uh, closely related to this concept of election is covenant. That's another important term that we see in the book of Genesis. A covenant is a relationship that God begins. He calls people into relationship with him to bless them, protect them, and provide for them. And in turn, he asks for their devotion to him and their loyalty to him and their worship of him, their obedience of him. There are two uh, covenants in Genesis. The the Noahic covenant, the covenant that God cut with Noah, never to flood the earth again. And then the other covenant is the Abrahamic covenant. And the Abrahamic covenant is the one that becomes the most prominent uh, throughout Scripture. You can see it especially in Romans 4 and Galatians 3. I'm not going to take time to look up uh, those verses now that you have in your notes. Please look at those as soon as you get a chance. But it extends beyond Israel to the Gentiles, and it leads to the doctrine of salvation by faith, by grace through faith, in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. So in short, the prominent biblical themes of creation, fourfold themes uh, in Genesis, and which extend throughout the whole Bible, are creation, the fall, redemption, and restoration. Hallelujah. And that all begins in Genesis. As a matter of fact, Genesis is the seed plot of the entire Bible. Themes, themes which begin in Genesis are developed throughout Scripture, climaxing in their greatest fulfillments in the book of Revelation. For example, the seed of the woman in Genesis 3.15 becomes Christ and his church in Romans 16, 20 and Revelation 12, 13 through 17. The garden or the paradise of God gives way to the city of God, the new Jerusalem in Revelation 21. The creation of the first heavens and earth that sin has corrupted give way to the creation of the new heavens and the new earth in Revelation 21. The rivers in the garden becomes the river of life for the healing of the nations in Genesis 22. The tree of life in Genesis 2 and 3 gives way, hallelujah, to the ultimate tree of life in Revelation 22. And the serpent introduced in Genesis 3 is ultimately cast into the bottomless pit in Revelation 20. I love, I think it's Romans 16, 20. That where Paul says the God of peace will soon crush Satan 
under your feet. Hallelujah. We're going to see that, friends. We're going to witness that. We're going to see God bring his fury and wrath on Satan and all the demons that have that have brought forth so much pain in our world. Our God is a vindicator. He's a righteous God, and he will vindicate his own and his name. Hallelujah. The New Testament often refers to what is introduced in Genesis, especially such important people as Noah and the flood, Israel's patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Sarah, Hagar, Ishmael, Rachel, Rebekah, and Joseph, and his brothers who become the 12 tribes of Israel. Genesis gives us the beginning of marriage. If we want to understand marriage, we go back to the beginning of family. There's so much there of work, of sin, and redemption, murder, capital punishment, sacrifice, races, languages, civilization, the Sabbath, the first attempt at the world to come together and and try to become like God. Uh, the theme of Babylon, which the book of Revelation will return to. It's in Genesis that we learn so much about suffering and how to handle suffering and God's purpose, purpose in suffering through an extensive account of Joseph. Think of how many chapters, about 13 Genesis, 37 through 50. The climax of the book of Genesis comes in Genesis 50, verse 20, a brief summary of God's redemptive nature and character. What does Joseph say to his brothers? You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Don't you just know that Paul was thinking about that when he quote, when he writes Romans 8, 28, and we know, he says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. Oh, the joy of the Old Testament and how necessary it is for us today. My friends, in all that has been said, uh, let me, before it, Joseph's life becomes an extraordinary example of trust in God in the midst of terrible, horrific suffering. I have gone to Genesis 37 through 50 many, many times in my life to be encouraged through Joseph's example. Remember, Paul said in Romans 15 verses 4 and 5 that the Old Testament was written for our example that through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Amen? In all that has been said, it should be evident, however, that Genesis is primarily a book about God. Nyesai, about his nature and the way that he desires to relate to man whom he exalted and created in his image and after his likeness. My friends, you were created in God's image and his likeness. Share that, meditate on that and share that with other people, especially those that don't know him. What a powerful evangelistic verse that is. In his commentary on Genesis, Herbert, Herbert Ryle writes this. He says, at every stage, God communicates his will to man. He's always speaking. The gods and goddesses in the Old Testament period, they didn't speak to man or woman. They didn't care about man or woman. But God is speaking. God is speaking. God is speaking. God is redeeming. God is restoring. God is providing. God is protecting. God is helping. God is encouraging. He's unlike any other God in Old Testament times. He communicates his will to man, to Adam and to Eve, to Cain, to Noah, to the patriarchs, to Hagar, to Rebekah, to Pharaoh even. And he hears their prayers. He makes covenants with them. He overrules the wrongdoings and troubles of life to be the means of blessing. One commentator uh, in his commentary, commentary on Genesis writes this, if the Bible were somehow stripped of the book of Genesis, as many people today would prefer, at least in our nation, the rest of the Bible would be incomprehensible. It would be like a 
two-story building without a ground floor, or a bridge with no support. Another commentator, A.W. Pink, wrote, Appropriately, has Genesis been termed the seed plot of the Bible? For in it we have, in germ form, almost all the great doctrines which are afterwards fully developed in the books of Scripture which follow. Another uh, man of God, J. Sidlow Baxter, wrote this, It has been truly said that the roots of all subsequent revelation are planted deep in Genesis, and whoever would truly comprehend that revelation must begin here. And that reminds me of something. We often hear, I hear in your culture, and I hear in my culture as well, uh, the word revelation. Oh, God gave me a revelation. Uh, we're looking for revelation knowledge. Let's just be very careful when we use that word, because in theology, remember this is Elam Theological Institute, in theology, there's a term called special, special revelation. And that is where God reveals himself, his purposes, and his ways to man in his word. And he's given us 66 books and no more. He's not currently adding new revelation about himself, about his purposes, and about his ways. So special revelation relates to the written word of God. General revelation relates to what we can observe in nature. And we can see in nature that this has this world has been created even by uh, a being that is good. Now, from special revelation, there's another concept that we use in theology, and it's called progressive revelation. What do we mean by progressive revelation? Progressive revelation. What do we mean by that? Well, we mean that God begins to reveal himself and his purposes and his ways in Genesis. And then he reveals more about himself, his purposes, and his ways in Exodus. And he reveals different things about himself in Proverbs. And in Isaiah and so on and so forth, he reveals more of himself, more of his ways, more of his purposes, and then he does it throughout the New Testament as well. And so you have this ongoing revealing of God's ways to different societies at different times. He always remains the same, but his revelation continues. So in the Gospels, we have the words of Jesus in the epistles. We have Paul and Peter um, explaining how the words of Jesus relate in their society at that time, 30 and 40 and 50 years later. But progressive revelation ends with the book of Revelation. God is not adding to Scripture because He revealed Himself, His purposes, and His ways, as He says in Hebrews, uh, to the prophets. And then He revealed Himself, His purposes, and His ways to the apostles, or just a few people that were very closely associated with the apostles, Mark and Luke. And then the writer of Hebrews, which theologians often will say is is known only to God. There's speculation it could be Silas, it could be Paul, it could be others. But we don't know who wrote Hebrews. 
All that said, we have to be careful when we use the word, I got a revelation from God, or God's giving me a fresh revelation. Because progressive revelation shows us that God begins to reveal himself, his purposes, and his ways in the Old Testament, but then he completes it ultimately in the New Testament. Now, the Holy Spirit gives us wisdom and insight in how to apply it. And that we can say, you know, I, I feel like the Lord gave me some fresh insight into his word. I prefer to use the word fresh insight rather than fresh revelation because I don't want to confuse people. I think that word revelation is used too loosely. And we have to be careful. We have to be humble. And I think that's the important thing for us to keep in mind as, as those who are called to teach the word of God. It is critical, it is crucial that we are humble before the Lord and before one another. Because there are a lot of men and women of God who are strong spiritually, but they're not willing to be accountable to others. They're not humble towards others. And that is a major fundamental flaw in their character. I pray, beloved, that you just walk before the Lord tenderly and before others tenderly. That you're willing to have someone correct you if you're wrong. Are you? God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. My friends, there are too many ministers in my nation and in your nation who are arrogant and they're not accountable to anyone but God and God still may use them but they're going to hurt a lot of people and I pray that you don't want to be that way but you want to be like Jesus who was humble and gentle well I'm running out of time now until next time may the Lord bless you and keep you may the Lord Make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom, both now and forevermore in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Yesai Ogwedu. And until next time, this is Pastor Brad Abley, grateful to be the professor of biblical studies with Elam Theological Institute. I look forward to seeing you eventually. Bye-bye.